Hello everyone and welcome back to the cataclysmic and inevitable comic vault. It is I, Captain Logan, and joining me this evening is the Day Ghost. And Austin, what are we going to talk about this time, sir? Uh, we're going to talk about Marvel Zombies. I mean, DCs. <laughs> uh, DC, sad that Marvel Zombies was taken because they didn't want to just, you know, steal that name and go, we're DC Zombies. They might as well, considering Old Man Whoever is a thing we're kind of doing at both companies right now. So now that I'm thinking about Old Lady Harley, I'm like, why couldn't they have just called it DC Zombies? Yeah, I, I didn't even realize Old Lady Harley was a thing. Oh my god. <laughs> that is a thing. <laughs> why? <laughs> I guess just because Old Man Whoever has been selling really well for Marvel, they've got at least three of them now. I'm sure there are more, because I've not been keeping up lately. But there's a. Uh, this has nothing to do with anything. But you know, you, you had Old Man Logan, of course. Yeah, I'm fascinated. And then eventually yeah. that got a monthly, and that was popular. And then you had Old Man Hawkeye, and there was Old Man Quill, and I'm sure there's other ones. But well, yeah, because like Old Man Hawkeye, I get because he's in that book. Yeah. Um, old, old Woman Harley feels like DC <laughs> just threw a bunch of names in a hat, and they're like, okay, who are we gonna get? Uh, Harley, I guess we can't do Batman. Because, uh, you know, Dark Knight Returns. Well, yeah, and also, anybody that's already got man in their name, it's redundant. So you're like, old man Batman? It just doesn't exactly roll off the tongue. Anyway, so let's talk about Deceased. This came out a couple of years ago and already has sequels. Uh, is already kind of a franchised thing that DC is doing. And at first when I heard about this, I thought it was the goofiest sounding thing and I kind of wasn't sure I even wanted to bother with it. I think the only reason I was curious about it is because it's written by Tom Taylor who did the Injustice comics and I've read the first year of Injustice. Uh, there's They split those up into years. I think it's like 12 mm. issues, around 12 for each of for, for each volume of that. And there's five years and then they did an Injustice 2 and there's I think like a, a, another thing, like a prequel thing, I forget now. Um, but anyway, he did a bunch of those, and it's it's all Tom Taylor, and I like what I've read of that. I've read the first volume of that probably three or four times, because every time I read it, I'm intending to review it and move <laughs> forward, and then I don't get around to that, and then when I'm ready to read it again, I cannot remember enough of what happened in that first year. So I read the first half of two once... Uh, but I gotta go back to one once again so I can finally read that whole run. But anyway, so I was curious about this because uh, I thought Tom Taylor was interesting. Um, Injustice was a uh, really fun novelty to me, but I thought the writing was a little bit hit and miss. And so I was curious to see, you know, if he had improved much and what uh, yet another apocalyptic you know, DC take from him would be. I'm like, oh, okay, so this guy's getting like typecast as a writer now. Like, he has to do yeah. these these Elseworlds uh, dystopian things where the good guys go bad. And um, it's interesting because when you really get into his writing, you realize he's kind of the last guy on the planet that uh, wants to write that kind of stuff, which I think is why they're as good as they are. And we'll probably talk about some of that as we get into this. But yeah, just Austin, from title alone, I was like, ah, that's dumb. And it's like they've got to go to zombies again, even though they already did their zombie bit with Blackest Night. Uh, but then after finally sitting down with it, it kind of won me over a little bit, maybe despite the premise. Yeah, it's funny. Last night I was talking to Dan, and I was like, oh, I got to go. I got to go uh, finish reading Deceased. And he just laughed and went, ah, oh, Deceased. <laughs> <laughs> You're trying too hard at that point. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that pun is it's a bit off-putting. I'm not going to lie. <laughs> but... But, uh, yeah, no, I had the same thing. I also thought this book was, like, a really quick read. Like, I was like, uh, I don't know. Like, I'll, I'm going to try to, you know, read through this as fast as I can for this review. And then I just blew straight through it. Like, it couldn't put it down. And Except he's... that also did not work out in my favor. <laughs> because I have the, um, the trade of this book, which came with, like one extra issue that was like spliced right in the middle and that was the issue i finished on the first night and i thought the story was going a completely different direction 
until if I you kept think reading. That's actually part of the sequence and not just a little side thing. Because uh, yeah, that's what it I, is. I he, he's talking about a uh, good day to die. Um, isn't isn't that what that was called? Yep. And it's a one shot that not only reads like maybe the book itself will go in a different direction if you, like you said, read it and trade and don't realize how the singles are broken up. Uh, I read this in singles, but digitally. Uh, and so it wasn't even in the middle of the sequence that I was looking at on uh, on, on DC Universe. Um, but I knew about that one shot, and I wasn't sure what it was, what the point of it was. So I'm glad that it was in that trade, because I did go ahead and look at it. And it fleshes some things out a little bit. It is wholly unnecessary, uh, but it's fun, and it's still Tom Taylor, and I like that they didn't just make it a side thing and somebody else wrote it. I also like that it doesn't have... It's not really an event thing, it's just a fun Elseworlds romp, so it's nice that they, they didn't feel the need to have a whole bunch of random tie-ins and stuff, it's just that one, and it's like, well, there's this, you know, magic corner of the DC universe, uh, in magic and also, like, time and space and stuff, like, the what are characters like Booster Gold and Constantine, um, those are two characters, by the way. N never put it. Characters like Booster Gold and Constantine, um, but just s some other characters that aren't Justice League people. Um, what 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 are they doing? Um, and how are they trying to save the world? And I like the idea that are the heroes that we're mainly following in this are not the only people that are trying to solve this problem. But of course, ultimately, spoiler alert: nobody's able to because the point of this book is uh, superheroes trying to save the world, not able to save the world at the end. It's not cynical about it, but I think the point at the end of the day is uh, what's important is saving humanity before the world. And I kind of like the, the distinction made there. Mm hmm. Yeah, um, I gotta say, like, going into this book, I expected it to be very much like, you know, this big, sprawling DC thing. And I think that's part of why when it did that switch uh, with that one issue, I was like, okay, now we're moving on to, like, different characters. Like, we got the Justice League, and now here we're gonna go to, like, other people. But this is kind of just a Superman book, I think. Yeah. I don't know if you had that reading it, which is funny because Batman is the cover of this trade <laughs> well batman sells things and if you look yeah. at the way dc is uh is is selling stuff right now the way it's soliciting things uh, you'd think that all they publish is batman and frankly com compared to previous years they're not publishing all that much more than, than batman things right now because that's the stuff that's selling for them and of course comics are in a weird place right now especially after covid uh mm -hmm. so yeah but that's that's always how we we like to sell these kinds of things because we know, uh, you know, the Batman diehards will buy it. And uh, yeah. one of the, one of the things I really appreciated about this book uh, right away is that it's not just a typical center everything on on Batman. He can solve everything because he's Batman kind of story. And it seems like Tom Taylor is is, is uh, making a concerted effort to try to kind of turn that whole thing on its head and get away from that a little bit, because th these kinds of stories just always go there. Uh, but I also like that he doesn't take Batman and Superman both off the table right away to say, like, they're not going to be important, let's put other characters you don't care about um, up front, and it also kind of helps uh, the thing to be less predictable in doing it that way. So, like, yeah, Superman's not going to get to save the day in this, and ultimately he is going to become a zombie, but I like that, uh, or, or I should say, you know, in, in anti-life uh, uh, corpse, because it's not, they're not exactly zombies, uh, which is another distinction I really like, the, the, the difference between undead and uh, anti-living, which is a term that Batman brings up early on and I wish was used more, because uh, it's, it, it's kind of a neat idea and we should get into that a little bit. Mm -hmm. Yeah, if you want, we can like get into the start of the book like with all that stuff. Sure. Uh, which is, of course, uh, the Justice League just beat Darkseid, and uh, you know they they use the lasso of truth on him so that he won't come back to Earth. Uh, little do they know he's captured uh, Cyborg, who is just straight up like '90s Cyborg. I thought that was interesting. A lot of stuff is straight up <laughs> the '90s versions of them because that's where uh, Taylor lives. 
and <laughs> he and I have a lot of similar sensibilities. Uh, I was texting Austin as I was reading the Good Day to Die one shot because I just couldn't believe all the 90s stuff that was coming out of nowhere, and it was blowing my mind. I was like, why are we dealing with Fire and Ice? Who cares about them now? <laughs> Fire and Ice were like C-Team Justice League back when Superman died in Death of Superman. Uh, they didn't have like the main core Justice League members, and I remember reading... Uh, Death of Superman when I was a kid being completely lost about the Justice League. I was like, it's a bunch of nobody heroes that nobody cares about with really generic costumes and also Guy Gardner. What is going on? And uh, and Fire and Ice show up in this. And I don't know, maybe we've been using them more in books lately and I'm not aware of it, but then, a couple pages later, Wave Rider. And like, my brain jumped out of my skull. I was like, who cares about Wave Rider? Like, I haven't seen this guy in 25 years. <laughs> Yeah, no, because uh, on a whim, I was like, huh, I wonder if Caps read this, like, random issue they spliced into here, and I texted you about it, and I'm glad I did, because it sounded like you had a hell of a time reading that. I did. I'm glad I'm glad that you mentioned that. I wish it wasn't in the middle of that trade, by the way, because, like, even though it would be, you know, out of sequence, I think it would have made a lot more sense to just tack it at the end. Be like, here's this side thing that happens in the middle. You know where everything goes now. I mean, it read really well to me after I read the six, and I I don't think I would have liked the interlude um, of it. But, like, you know, you read the six, and then you read that, and it's like, here is, you know, just opening up the universe a little bit. Um, the six issues themselves as a story pretty tightly woven i wouldn't have wanted to get away from like you said earlier uh, superman and wonder woman and, and our main characters and then jump over to constantine land for 35 pages mm -hmm. well i think the issue with it and part of why i didn't realize that that was uh you know this random side issue was because the issue before it ends with um Captain Adam, I think. Yeah. He he um like explodes and he nukes uh like three cities. I think it's Washington, Baltimore, and Metropolis. And it just looks like the entire Justice League and char like all the characters we've been following up to that point are just dead. So it's oh. like, oh, all of these characters are dead. And then we jump over. So then you thought like, we were pivoting Constantine to doing. the people that could actually solve this problem. Yeah, now. I thought I thought it was like, okay, now we're going to these characters. Like now, like the, those other characters are dead now. Now we're going to focus on these people. So that must have been a bizarre adjustment for you because then you come back and it's like, oh, the characters I've been following all along not only aren't dead, but like collectively they have sort of a character arc. So like you thought you were done with them and then you get to the end of the book and you're like, now I see where this was all going, but I thought we got rid of it all. And that could have worked, I guess. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, yeah, it was like this, like, oh, they're back. <laughs> oh, okay. I like that was weird. Why did we cut to that? Oh, well, I guess like Constantine will now show up. Oh, he doesn't. What? What was that about? <laughs> and then that was when I found out it was just like a spin-off thing. <laughs> Yeah, uh, we're jumping around a lot, but the atom explosion uh, thing was interesting because uh, I think that's uh, – I'm trying to remember. There's another Elseworlds book that – or Elseworlds Ask book that does that. I think it's Kingdom Come. Like right in the middle we blow up the atom, but I can't remember if it's that book or something else. Yeah, I, I feel like I've seen – I had this flashback where I was like I've seen exactly this scene before. I think I've seen maybe not exactly that, but like – him like maybe about to explode and then they stop it or something i've definitely seen was. that uh that kind of thing before but i i also can't remember where it was from <laughs> but yeah so you, you were trying to take us more linearly from the beginning so going back for a minute i uh, again it, it it took me a minute to even want to read this book and the thing that uh started getting me kind of uh, jazzed about and realizing, okay, Taylor's doing the same thing to some degree that he did with Injustice. It's going to be this really bleak, dark, like ostensibly edge lordy thing where, you know, isn't it cool to see the, you know, the, the, the good guys turn into, you know, psychopaths or turn into, you know, evil zombies or whatever. Um, but he's going to be tongue in cheek about it and he's not going to take it too seriously. And it's going to be all the fun things we remember about, uh, superhero comics growing up like it's weird as as dark and bleak as this stuff is at least in premise it feels like it's 
written, if not for kids, for for like the the sensibilities that we had when we were kids reading comics. Like both of these books have that. And the <laughs> moment where I was like, okay, I might be in for a treat here, is when uh, Dark Side accidentally blows himself up with the anti-life equation and takes Apocalypse with him. And we have the classic Jack Kirby, Dark Side is, you turn the page, Dark Side was! <laughs> I love it so much! Oh yeah, no, that part was great. <laughs> it's so good! Yeah, because Dark Side like jumps out of his like base or whatever, just onto Apocalypse, and I'm like, oh, like he's gonna run wild on a- Oh no, he just blew up the <laughs> entire planet. <laughs> yeah, he started to, because he's the first of the zombies. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, because it's his kind of machinations with the anti-life equation on Cyborg. Uh, he like rewrites the like uh, uh, anti-life equation. So instead of being what it normally is, it like creates zombies, and he ends up being the first one. I, I have I have a question about that, mm -hmm. which is simply why. Uh, th th that's one of the big things I wanted to ask you if if there was something <laughs> I, that I was missing because I reread the, this page four or five times just trying to understand what the point was of rewriting it. If the idea was he couldn't get the full anti-life equation, so he, like, approximated a thing that he was able to do by grabbing the black racer, because he's, like, he needed a piece of death in order to make the anti-life equation happen with the half he had and the half that's in Cyborg. And he's, like, and, and, then, and then he rewrote it. And I'm, like, well, then he probably would have been able to take over the universe and been just fine if he just hadn't done that. What am I yeah, missing? Something to do with uh, like Cyborg, like if he does that, if he just uses the anti-life equation, it'll kill Cyborg. Like he's not strong oh, enough yeah, to hold and it. And if he dies, it takes the equation his, with him. It takes the equation with him. Yeah. And but then, I didn't understand what rewriting it did to keep Cyborg alive exactly. I felt like there was something not communicated there. Um. Or like how Dark Side knew that if you. Like like something something plus death plus you know all these all these mm -hmm. other like uh, you know like like uh, your sad tragic concepts you put them all together and you get a pseudo anti life equation. Mm -hmm. Evil and like I haven't read a lot of that stuff, so I wasn't even sure if rewriting the anti life equation was something you could do outside of this book. Me neither. And this and honestly, the New God stuff is not stuff I've read a lot of, and I don't know a great deal about it. Mm -hmm. I guess Dark Side though he forgot to carry a one in that equation, and then apparently so. <laughs> well, and then there's just the question of what exactly the equation is, because it's also a sentient life form. So, like, I, I always thought the anti-life equation was simply you do some math, and now you're and it, it works sort of like magic. That whole, uh, you know, at some point, the science we don't understand just looks like magic, where it's like. If you figure out this equation, now you can control death, uh, and you can eliminate free will. And when, in this, I couldn't tell if the idea was that the equation itself is alive, uh, ironically enough, or if the idea is that it, if you do the equation, it leads to a thing that is a sentient life form. I, I, I did not understand that whole thing. Yeah, I'm not entirely sure that works, and that could just be my own like ignorance with this material. Right. But uh, yeah, I'm not entirely sure that works. Like I was completely again, we're jump, we gotta jump all the way to the end for a second. But I was <laughs> completely shocked when Cyborg bookends the book by pulling out the Lasso of Truth again. Because like you mentioned, we get the Lasso with Darkseid at the beginning, uh, where Wonder Woman puts it on Darkseid, and she says, uh, basically, what's your plan? And she's and, and he's like, well, I've already got what I need. Uh, and he just leaves, and, he, and now he's got the anti-life equation, um, or the stuff to make his own homebrew version of it. Um, then at the end, uh, Cyborg does the same thing to Wonder Woman after she's been zombified, uh, which is a really neat bookend, uh, and mm -hmm. it, it's it's kind of it's kind it's kind of fun, uh, kind of provocative just to see somebody use the lasso against an evil Wonder Woman, and uh, now the uh, the equation, the like collective evil consciousness, as it says, has a voice. 
in kind of the most unsettling uh, panel of the entire book. The, just the look on Zombie Woodwoman's <laughs> face, and the, I really like uh, how that's drawn. What is that, uh, Trevor Trevor Hare scene? I really like what he did with that panel. But anyway, uh, I don't know about you, I was like, oh, they're talking now? Okay. <laughs> Yeah, no, I, I had that same thing because they they never talked before then, and then all of a sudden it's like, oh, yes. I guess I guess we they can't talk. A voice. It was, it was like I was having Starro flashbacks. <laughs> this planet is mine, <laughs> <laughs> and not just from that movie because I've seen other things with Starro and he works like that. But yeah, well, yeah, no, I know, but. I just wanted to quote that movie. <laughs> Star was awesome. But yeah, I was just really shocked when it's like, oh, now the equation is talking. All right. Not really sure how that works. Yeah, yeah. I'm not entirely sure either. I guess, uh, you know, math, it, it'll kill you. <laughs> it can talk. I don't know. <laughs> uh, I love all the satire about... Um, you know, overuse of technology and specifically social media, but also uh, just, you know, math itself seeming so complicated and confusing and, uh, and convoluted to people who, like me, are not math people uh, that you have on, I think, maybe the same page uh, or a couple pages close to each other, Green Arrow both saying, uh, of course, math is going to kill us all, but also... Uh, I knew someday we'd have to destroy the internet. I just didn't think it would look like this. <laughs> well, yeah, that's the interesting thing, because, uh, like, zombies by their very nature are very, like, satirical. Like, most good zombie films are also satire. Um, and I think that's kind of what this book brings to that as a genre, is that it's more of, like, a uh, social media, like, internet kind of... Uh, like, look at all of us zombies on the internet. And in some ways it updates it uh, in, a f in, in a fresher way than I've ever seen it. And I don't know about you, I don't think this really reads totally like a zombie book. Um, but it's a classic zombie thing, like you said, in the sense that... I, I guess it starts to feel more like a zombie thing toward the end when we zombify Superman and all of that. But, like, you, you, I had this too. When you, when you first read it, you told me that you were initially expecting it to just be like Justice League fighting a horde of zombies and we don't get a lot of those shots like it's not like Blackest Night where a, like every panel seems to just be gummed up with like thousands and thousands of the undead I was mm -hmm. made fun of that book because I can never tell where we are there's no sense of location at all in that <laughs> uh, it's just like like hordes of zombies on every page and this doesn't have that, but the thing that, uh, that like you said, it's it's kind of bringing new to the table, but also making it feel like a classic zombie thing, is that it's got that social commentary, and it updates it in that it's not, like, it's similar but different. It's not about uh, materialism, like, uh, like earlier zombie things um, tend to be about, uh, or just that, that, um, that genre in general. Uh, but it's about how uh, social media might be changing us into something less than human already. Like, that's the metaphor. And the whole book isn't constantly exploring that idea. That's kind of just the premise that's set up in the first place. But it, it I, I found it, like, really thought-provoking um, just in all the directions my mind was taking that uh, when that's brought up in the first place. And that's the most creative notion in this, I think. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's the, uh, it's the end of the Simpsons zombie uh, segment where they're all watching TV. Yeah. Uh, just updated. <laughs> Yeah, because you, you also have that classic idea of, you know, television is turning us into zombies. I think the difference here is the idea of the virus that spreads. Oh, of course. That's, like, probably the biggest thing this adds to uh, zombies is that it's not just, like, a physical thing. It is literally, like, an internet virus uh, that, like, spreads across uh, social media. And if you see it on your phone, it'll turn you into a zombie, too. Yeah, and the metaphor is that 
the zombies themselves are then passing it on and turning people into zombies, in, in other zombies, um, mm-hmm. which is, of course, the the main thing that it has in common with standard zombie things is that the zombies can turn people uh, you know, into what they are. But I like that Batman makes the distinction uh, between traditional zombies and like he doesn't even want to call them that because they're not really that so you've got the traditional zombies that are um trying to satiate hunger and these zombies just want to spread death and i think the metaphor there is that uh if you look at it in its most negative light of course because there are different sides to this don't get me wrong there are good things about social media too uh but when you when you take it to its you know furthest negative extreme I think the idea is social media can, uh, like, spread, uh, like, negative ideas like wildfire and, uh, like, like these zombies are spreading death and transform us into drones. And the, the irony is the thing that we're using in order to try to, uh, like promote our individuality is actually the thing that's turning us all into a hive mind. Mm-hmm. And that's what you have here. Yeah, and so the big difference between regular zombies and these zombies is um, regular zombies turn everybody into what they are, but they are all individuals, even though they all act exactly the same way. And this is a hive mind. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, exactly. It's more of, uh, like you said, the Starro thing in that way than like traditional zombies yeah and it's the and it's the borg idea done in more of a traditional zombie way uh because mm-hmm. there's also and i just thought of this it's also the borg in not just you know the the hive mind but also in that it's biological and mechanical oh yeah oh yeah absolutely so that's interesting yeah no absolutely um Sorry, I'm just like flipping through this. So many good, uh, just, like, great pages, great art in this book. <laughs> yeah, uh, let's talk about art for a second since you're there. Uh, so I mentioned earlier uh, Trevor Hearsian. He is the main artist for this book. Uh, the, yeah, the we first, jump around, don't we? Or the first is it the and same? last issue, he shares art duties with one or two other guys, and I actually found that somewhat jarring and wish it hadn't been done that way. Uh, but mm-hmm. at least we're not jumping between artists from issue to issue. So his fingerprints are on all six of them, uh, which, of course, gives it a visual style and a sense of continuity. Um, I like the heavy line work in his art. I like the uh, that it's a little scary. Uh, I like the stylistic but not cartoony faces. Uh, there's not an attempt at, at realism here, and I think uh, he's, if if I'm not stretching too far, I think he might even be homaging Walking Dead a little bit in the style of faces and stuff. Um, but you, you get to, uh, and I don't have the other artist names in front of me, but you get to uh, that that uh, cyborg scene real early in the sec in, in the first issue and it's a completely different art style that doesn't match that at all and it looks good and the whole book could have looked like that I would have been fine with it but I found that super jarring where it's just, just suddenly a completely different style <laughs> yeah no um, I remember thinking like the art kind of jumped around like while reading it um, but I'm just looking for that Exact. Oh, yeah, no, it absolutely just completely changes. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know why that choice was made. I don't know if it was a deadline thing and if it was too many pages because I, and I might be wrong because I'm looking at this digitally and the page count is off because some of the ads are left in on DC Universe. Um, oh, okay. The, not the, uh, like, regular print ads for whatever, like, you know, video games and serials and stuff that they're selling, but the, the, the DC stuff. Um, but I'm pretty sure the first and last issues have a few more pages than the rest of them do. And so it may just be in order to get the to meet the deadline with the page count. Um, maybe that maybe maybe that guy just couldn't draw the 28, 30, 32 pages, whatever it is. Yeah, like it was just a little bit too much. That, that could be. But I but I'm not sure and I've not looked into it. Mm-hmm. And they also might have just thought that those styles fit those scenes better for some reason, but Usually you don't do that unless there's some sort of 
reality shift or there is or like something is a flashback or like i'm not sure what the point is just okay we're in apocalypse now so the art style has to look totally different that's that's weird to me mm-hmm. yeah i mean i guess maybe like just for apocalypse they were like let's make this slightly different i've i have no idea Uh, but anyway, so uh, like we were talking about earlier, Batman is uh, not in a lot of this because he gets killed at the end of the first issue. And... Which was the biggest shock to me because I assumed, I mean, he's Batman. I was like, they're going to, I mean, I went into this book thinking the entire Justice League would end up dying. Um, but I figured, you know, Batman would make it at least towards the end because he's Batman and they're going to want to milk the Batman punching zombies thing as much as they can. <laughs> that is the cynical part of me uh, going into this book. Well, there's every reason to have that kind of cynicism because that's usually what we do. And usually, we usually say Batman's yeah. got a contingency for, for everything. He's ready for anything. He's the smartest guy in the room. Um, we're, we're dancing around that and playing with it a lot in this book. We're like, everybody treats him like he is that, but this is the situation that he's just not quite ready for so he's so he's got the um you know like like boy scout be prepared for everything thing as much as he can but he's not ready for his sidekicks to get zombified in the middle of his house um mm -hmm. so i i like that he meets a thing that he can't stop and i like that he's still super batman resourceful but he just he, he just can't fully handle it like he does everything he can do um, or at least it's played like he can do every, like he, he does everything he can do. I, I, it's a little contrived to get him killed earlier. I guess I'm respecting the choice, so <laughs> I want to be okay with it. I will say it's weird that, and I don't fully understand this. We were talking about this over text. I don't fully understand the, uh, the way his internet works in the first place. Uh, he's able to shut down his internet um, in the Batcave and then work on an intranet, I guess just so that he can use his cameras that he's got throughout the city to monitor stuff. And mm -hmm. so he doesn't see the virus in the first place that that uh, on screens is turning everybody into a zombie. So it's this, like like we said earlier, mechanical and or digital and biological thing where somehow the anti-life equation comes through a screen and transforms you into part of this, uh, this hive zombie uh, uh, consciousness that then uh, spreads death and and is able to find life anywhere where it is, um, and then and then kill everyone or turn everybody into these zombies after you've killed them. Um, Batman is able to shut down the internet in his cave, but it doesn't immediately shut it down in his house, and I don't know why. It's like, did he just not think to do that? Why are they not connected? Is it yeah. that he's afraid if they are, if it is connected that somebody would find out he's Batman through that? Like, they could follow it into the cave or something? I question that. I thought it was weird, too, that he had to use an EMP on his own house instead of just pressing a button and shutting his internet down. <laughs> I didn't really get that. Oh, it's because it's much more dramatic. Well, that's <laughs> he's, true. He's got, that's... A, he's got a scream and then EMP is out. <laughs> <laughs> yeah i was a little confused reading it the first time and i'll see if i can find it here and see if it's maybe not as bad as i remember it but the way it's worded is like batman's like firewalls in the uh bad computer like that's what stops the virus from getting through right but he's also but, but then in the same breath it also says he shut down all of the internet he's working on an intranet and he's using analog cameras throughout the city Mm hmm yeah exactly so it was just kind of like a bit confusing as to how that works because you immediately cut to batman on like on the back computer and it's from behind mm -hmm. so i was like oh are we gonna like flip around and he's a zombie oh oh no is the back computer worked it out it's okay <laughs> there are some bits like that where and it's funny too because most of the time where we contrive, where I think there's maybe a little bit of a contrivance in the plotting is not to make things easier for our heroes, but actually to make it harder for them. Uh, because a lot of this, of course, is the novelty of 
it's it's another comic book destroy the world scenario and mm-hmm. so we've got to figure out how we're gonna you know creatively take out a lot of these characters i uh, similarly i had well in in that one shot there's also the mr terrific question uh why <laughs> why is he able to just because he's got a mask with maybe lenses in it question mark because we don't even talk about what it is but something about the mr terrific mask makes it to where he uh if he looks at screens he doesn't get zombified and we're not told that it's the blurry thing that it is with flash and some other characters either uh where they mm. do you remember that where they just have the like like a a, a thing in their uh helmets that makes everything blurry so that they don't get the anti-life equation we have um they've started handing out like uh contact lenses for all the characters they can see screens because it's like oh it'll blur out your vision and my first thought was all that's gonna do is ruin your eyes (laughs) well they even say you're gonna get a massive headache but it's better than being undead (laughs) I wasn't sure that would work, and then I just really wanted because I love the levity in this book and in in with with oh, Taylor Green and, Arrow is great in this book. I will say that sometimes the the and and I had this with Injustice too. Sometimes I feel like the humor goes a little too far in like a cheese ball direction, but for the for the most part, that's I, fair. I, I like the levity again. I like that we're not taking it too seriously, but I like that the jokes are coming from. Uh, character stuff with like people you know staying in character it doesn't it doesn't feel usually um forced and tacked on and you just pushed on us uh but it's this light-hearted writing for a real you know bleak kind of concept um and that makes it it makes it feel more escapist and kind of more real all at the same time. Like, I, like I'm able to buy the heartwarming stuff a lot more because uh, there's there's dimension to these characters. Even when all when when the world is falling apart, um, people occasionally make jokes because real people do with that. Especially characters like Green Arrow that use that for a defense mechanism. Um, so I really appreciate all of that mm-hmm. for the most yeah, part. Yeah, made me sad. I was that going somewhere I with that. Time to come and back. I can't remember. What, <laughs> yeah, because he was great. I. I for the most part, I like the way Taylor writes him. Yeah, well, it's the first time I've ever read Constantine, but I liked him quite a bit. And I liked that they, he kind of flips that cliche of like, oh, this character says they're not coming back, and then they do thing, in that he comes back, but everybody dies anyway. <laughs> it's just weird that we never see him again in the mm-hmm. main book, because he's like... Or maybe that's supposed to be the joke, you know, because he's like... Uh, you know, I'm, the the world's not gonna fall apart on my watch, and then we do we do lose the Earth at the end, and we never see Constantine again. So I don't know what exactly he was gonna try to do to stop it, but it doesn't matter because I guess he's dead. Yeah, yeah, no. Unless I, he was I, one I, of the seven thousand people on the Ark, and we just didn't ever see him. Yeah, he'll be in the sequel. He'll just be on that other planet with Doctor Fate. <laughs> and maybe, maybe he isn't. I don't know. Um... I should mention, like I said earlier, there are a couple of sequels uh, already, and this was just two years ago, so I imagine it's probably going to be like Marvel Zombies, where this just keeps going. Um, there is... there is, So, the second one is just a three-issue thing about what the villains were doing during all of this, and then the third one uh, is a lot longer. It's like, I think it's like 12 or 15 issues I, I i forget but it it's significantly longer um and i don't and i assume that that's just a follow-up on on the on their earth too that's interesting that it's like what the villains were doing because when i think it's in that issue like the spinoff one um it opens with like amanda waller and mr terrific looking at like a zombie captain boomerang yeah and i thought we were gonna get like some suicide squad stuff with that and then she never shows up again, so... Yeah. Well, and we also make a point right at the beginning that this is not going to be uh, what you expect, and we're not going to do some of the typical things we usually do, because we also get Joker off the off the table real fast. Mm-hmm. Actually, I think, now that I'm saying it, I think the Amanda Waller thing... Yeah, no, that's in the main book. It's not uh, Mr. Terrific. It's uh, Captain Adam. Oh, that's right. Yeah, she she's there because they've got uh, a couple of different contingencies they're going back and forth between, uh, and ultimately they write off 
um, Ray Palmer because he's he's disappeared. They don't know what's happened to him. That's actually one of the more chilling things that happens in this, uh, where, where you've got a tiny Ray Palmer that can that, that uh, is a zombie and can make uh, the atom explode. And he's supposed to be like their nuclear contingency, and then the anti-life equation uses that against everybody. Um, mm-hmm. And so it's it's Amanda Waller doing her ends justify the means thing and uh, and destroying whole cities or possibly the world once again, uh, but in like two pages because you don't see her through the rest of it. So I really appreciated that because I don't like Amanda Waller. Uh, yep, most we of the should time. have seen her get killed by zombies. That would have been great. <laughs> <laughs> but this book is not about those kinds of novelties, right? Like, yeah, not, no, it doesn't really do anything like that. There's not a lot of play, and like there not are gruesome lot. images, but there's never a place where it's like, you know, isn't it fun to get to see? There's not like a perverse pleasure that you get reading this book, uh, and like I said, it's not really cynical. So it's it's weirdly like straightforward in a very standard superhero book in a lot of ways, uh, mm-hmm. but just as an Elseworld thing where everybody can die. Um, so, like, most everybody dies, but it's still got kind of a hopeful ending. Yeah. Which, which I really appreciate. Uh, but you don't have those panels where it's like, ah, oh, you never thought you'd see, uh, you know, Superman biting off, you know, Lex Luthor's face, did you? Like, we don't do that. Yeah, no, I think the only time you really get anything like that is uh, The Flash's death, where it's uh, Superman and The Flash, like, running as fast as they can straight at each other and the flash explodes yeah um and then you've got uh like like the pieces of the flash stuck in the superman and so like mm-hmm. i guess i uh, you know maybe um somebody could read that and be like you know have the like perverse fanboy thing of like oh man flash is turning superman into a zombie you guys <laughs> But I yeah, just read that as a is, thing that was like happening, a... and as like a tragic reveal before it was, uh, uh, mm-hmm. you know, like like brutal teenage, yeah, <laughs> you know, kind of. Oh reveal. yeah, no, it it definitely works both ways. I think just because like the way the flash explodes, it's like that's definitely like a big, like yeah moment. <laughs> The, I guess the other one, maybe. Uh, but again, this was just played as a reveal of this character is still alive. You thought he was probably dead moment. But Cyborg blowing the giant hole in Zombie Giganta? I guess that's the other one? Oh, yeah. Because yeah. he's Absolutely. standing... Because the, the, cause the camera angle is huge hole in a person with Cyborg standing behind it. <laughs> We, we do end, come to think of it, we tend to end the issues on the most gruesome images, right? Because we do the same mm-hmm. thing with um, that super gruesome image of Batman getting uh, ripped apart by his sidekicks at the end of the first issue. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, exactly. I guess and that's where the gruesome novelties are. Even, like, Aquaman, like, you don't really see Aquaman get uh, killed. Like, it's, it's more implied... Like, Aquaman goes onto a ship, opens a door, it's filled with zombies, and then they rush him, and they all just fall into the ocean. You don't actually see him get ripped apart. And then he shows up later as a zombie. Which which is kind of like the one big, like, everybody fighting zombies action scene. Yeah, but kind of mitigated as also more of a fun traditional comic book thing because it's also with the big sea monster. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And it's also not, like, look, Superman's, like, heat vision and zombies, because it's just, it's mostly the, um, uh, like, Amazons. Yeah. Like, uh, Green Arrow, I guess. Green Arrow gets to kill uh, Aquaman, which I guess is, like, a... uh, a fanboy moment, maybe? I didn't think of that. Yeah. <laughs> maybe it is for... T- but I, I guess it just depends on how you look at it and what your sensibilities are and stuff. Like, mm-hmm. th- this is a little bit subjective, but you can either look at that as, you know, the obvious fanboy thing to do or kind of just a clever nod to, you know, the 70s comics. Like... Mm-hmm. Yeah, no, absolutely. Because I didn't even I'm think s- of that. That that's That is kind of fun. Like... I don't know. It's it's a fine line you walk between, uh, you know, being a fan of this stuff like uh, like this guy clearly is, uh, and doing just fun things that folks never thought they'd see, and being too fanficish about it, and being too um, self referential. And I, I think he tiptoes that line pretty well most of the time. 
Mm-hmm. Yeah, exactly. And, uh, like, I guess another big thing in the book, but it's not, like, super, like you said, like, fanboy or, like, fan fiction-y, is kind of, like, different characters taking up new mantles. Like, yeah. you get both the Batman and Superman mantles uh, switching, and you get the Green Lantern thing with uh, Black Canary. With Diana, which I like, I love so much. I think it's my favorite thing in the book, actually. Uh, and I've seen so many reveals in recent years of, look, this person you never thought would be a Green Lantern is a Green Lantern, and I tend to roll my eyes at it now. I didn't with that. Uh, I think partially it's because it's set up so well, because there's a really nice foreshadowing moment in in that in the scene where they're out in the campfire. Uh, and by the way, that's where the worst uh, comedy in the book is. I think is that campfire scene. Um, there's oh yeah, like like the thing where they start to. Um, to like you know sort of sing karaoke is dumb and then right before that uh i you you've you had like green arrow with the killjoy core and i'm like eh, i don't i don't care i don't care for this writing right now um but it distracted me uh to where i wasn't expecting the very next thing to happen is how jordan gets turned into a zombie so i guess it did its job maybe um but there uh, Dinah and um, Oliver are making fun of how for not having the willpower to not go camping because he doesn't like camping. And uh, they're like, he's like, well, I'm known for my will. I'm, I'm, the, I'm a Green Lantern. And they're like, well, you could have fooled me. We, we got you to go camping. You don't even like camping. And then Dinah, who's part of making fun of him, six seconds later becomes a Green Lantern. So that, that was just some, a nice bit of writing there. It was nicely set up. But also, um, she keeps her jacket, and it looks so good <laughs> for, for a Green Lantern outfit. I, I love it so much. And the maybe, and I'm not a big Green Lantern guy, so I've, I've, not, I've not read a ton of Green Lantern. Um, so I don't, I don't have any standards for this. But I, I think uh, Taylor does the cleverest use, and maybe part of it's just because I'm, you know, I'm a Birds of Prey Black Canary fan, but... He does, for me, the cleverest thing I've ever seen with a Green Lantern ring, when toward the end, she uses it to make a megaphone and then do her canary cry through her <laughs> megaphone? That's awesome! Yeah, no, that's pretty it's good. It's so good! <laughs> well, yeah, and it's interesting, too, because, of course, like, Green Lantern and Green Arrow were, like, a famous uh, duo in the comics. I didn't even think of that. Yeah, well... You make Green Arrow's wife... Yeah, uh, and, then she Green become, and then she becomes, a you know, almost, like, amalgamation of those... Mm -hmm. I didn't even think of that. That's so cool. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. And in the same book where we had one kill the other one. Yeah, that's great. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, that that whole thing I thought was pretty cool. I, I like was starting to expect we'd see more of that because that's in issue two. And then we don't, which is nice because if they did it too much, it would have been uh, obnoxious. Yeah, like... <laughs> This strikes me as a thing that is supposed to just be a fun novelty that we know will sell a lot of books. That is assigned <laughs> to a guy who's like, oh, you want me to do that? Because I did an evil <laughs> Superman? Okay. And then he makes the best of it, and it's probably... And who knows if that's how it happened, but um, it reads like that to me. And it's like, because they went to a guy that didn't want this, it's why it's as good as it is. That That's how it reads to me, if, if, if that <laughs> is indeed the... The, the truth and of course that can backfire um you know sometimes if your heart's just not in it it would just you know read lame and uh, uninspired but um like i said with him it worked with injustice where that and we know that was you know of, of course in a signed thing uh and he didn't really like the idea of having to write an evil superman so he just tried to figure out how he could make it as realistic and believable not, not realistic, but, you know, as, as, as believable for that character as possible. Um, I read an interview with him today where, where he went on record to say he doesn't believe in that story, uh, that Superman <laughs> would ever do that, and he wrote the thing. I have so much respect for that, for him saying that, for him do, doing the best with it, for him taking on the challenge, because it's sort of like somebody who uh, doesn't want to be a leader but is forced into a leadership role. Like, sometimes those end up being the best leaders. Uh, and I <laughs> feel like he's got that with, with, with Dark Superman, where, and, and just, you know, dark, or, or, like, transforming heroes into villains and that sort of thing in the first place, um, where it's like, 
he doesn't go he doesn't do what most people do he doesn't take it too seriously he doesn't go the deconstruction route at all like we're not deconstructing anything at all with this book <laughs> it's a traditional superhero book where most of the superheroes turn into zombies that's what I it don't is know. I don't know. I think Alfred deconstructs Batman's brain with his shotgun, but I think that's probably different than what you mean. <laughs> that is. It's, it's, it, and that's also not the main reason he used the shotgun. <laughs> I don't know. There's probably a deleted panel somewhere where he's like, Alfred, you used this to deconstruct me. <laughs> but yeah, it's amazing to me. Uh, and, and again, this is why I was curious about this once I found out who was writing it, because the best thing about the Injustice comics is that uh, the morality and altruism of and, and just you know spirit of Superman is so intact even while he's the scariest thing that happens, and um, he's and he's got that with this except this time he gets to keep Superman um, actually Superman through the majority of the book and then th at the mm -hmm. point where he's not he's a non person and so Tom yeah. Taylor doesn't have to once again write that. Well, yeah, and Superman, like I said at the start, is kind of the main character of this book. Like, we get his stuff more than anybody else. And uh, I think, like, one of the best just Superman moments is when he has to go back to Smallville to save his parents. Yeah. But he also can't fly by every single, like, person that's in trouble on the way. And because of that, he's late to, like, save his dad. Yeah, it's gut-wrenching. It's awesome. Mm-hmm. Yeah, no, it's it's so good, and it's a it's a really interesting um, I kind of take on the uh, on on that you know Superman the movie scene with where where he realizes he can't save his he can't save everybody he couldn't save his dad from the heart attack like it's kind of a riff on that in a way. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's not his dad's in a tornado. <laughs> <laughs> I don't want to talk about that anymore. <laughs> yeah, no. Um, no, I was pretty uh, shocked by that. Like, when he gets to the farm and, like, his dad's, like, locked up in the barn as, like, a zombie. If you... Th this is another one of those books that I, I think is even better on a second read, and I picked up a lot more stuff. And when, when you read this a second time, I uh, that whole thing with Superman is made even more tragic. And I think I appreciate his, uh, you know, his, his turn at the end, like, like having to become a zombie and all of that, like that all, um, like hurts more because he has to watch, you know, his dad turn into, into a zombie. But right before that, he has an exchange with Damien where, I uh, he, he seems to, where, where like, he really appreciates what Damien is going through because, he just lost his father. And that's what makes him think, oh crap, I've got to go to Smallville and see how my parents are. And he loses his dad immediately after he's he's feeling so much for Damien, who's just lost his, who is Batman, mm -hmm. who is Superman's best friend. Yeah. I mean, there's like there's a lot of like not just heart in this book, but like it's not it's not corny. It's not sappy. Like some actual honest to God decent drama in this book. Yeah, no, I liked Superman's line because he's talking to Lois, uh, who's, like, asking about Damien. And uh, I think the line is something like, uh, you know, he's Bruce's son. He'll, like, push that pain down inside of himself forever. But at the end of the day, he just lost his dad. Yeah. I thought that was really good. And then he goes and he loses his dad. Mm. So And then his son loses his dad. <laughs> Yes. Yeah, exactly. Um and and that's and that's Damien's best friend. A lot friend. of dad losing. Yes. So I uh, I just I want to go to this for a second cuz there was a point I meant to make a long time ago that that just reminded me of, which is I was talking earlier about contrivances the story feels the need to make in order to put characters into more precarious situations or get people killed off. Um it, it sort of like with the our, our kind of questions about Batman's internet, in the sentence I never thought I'd say. Um, I also found myself wondering why Superman didn't immediately, once he gets infected, try to go find some kryptonite and just stab himself. Because they ultimately end up trying that method later anyway, where when Wonder Woman has uh, that kind of 
like Thor Infinity War moment where she's got to like forge a weapon that's the only thing that can do a thing uh where it's like it's it's crypt it's kryptonite and magic and we'll use this to you know take out the the uh the Superman zombie um before that Superman is lamenting uh maybe not uh, committing suicide fast enough. Another sentence I never thought I would say. Uh, in flying up into space and depriving himself of oxygen fast enough to kill him, the zombie uh, that he's about to become before he can heat vision the universe. Right, and he's he's uh, he's lamenting the fact that uh, he had to stay and make a speech to John Kent, which is. Uh, for my money, the most heart-wrenching moment and most heartwarming moment of the whole book, where he says, mm -hmm. uh, and again, I don't think it's too sappy, I think I think it earns it, uh, where he he tells his son, um, I've been to, uh, I, I've seen a lot of the universe and you were the best thing in it. Um, I don't know, man, like, call, <laughs> call me a sap, maybe some of it's just because I'm a dad, but like, <laughs> I read that panel and I just wanted to go give give my my son a hug, you know what I mean? Like, it's, 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 it's a wonderful moment. And then he was like, mm. I wasted a lot of time doing that, and some people might die. Why didn't he go... Because he knows Batman. Why didn't he go... I know Batman had a, had that Tower of Babel-type contingency for all of us, and that comes into play right after that. Uh, why don't I just go to Alfred and see if there's a piece of kryptonite I can stab myself with? I don't know, I don't know why that doesn't come up earlier than it does. Yeah, he should have just, like, used his x-ray vision, found Metallo, and just flown straight into him. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I guarantee you Metallo is not going to be in that three-issue miniseries about the villains. No, probably he probably doesn't show up in any of these. <laughs> but do you agree with that, that it's weird that Kryptonite doesn't come up earlier? Uh, yeah, I mean, it's definitely you know kind of convenient just in the sense that they need to have him say goodbye to everybody which is nice and does feel like superman yeah uh but no i, I do agree with you about that because he kind of like ruins everything by doing that <laughs> yeah and uh superman probably would have thought about that <laughs> That, that's what I think, but there's only a couple of instances of that. Um, I mean, again, pretty tightly plotted. For the most part, I bought most mm -hmm. everything that was happening um, in, yeah. in the context of this. Yeah, it's more just, like, convenient, I guess, than anything. Again, it's stopping more so to have, you know, these kind of, like, heartwarming moments. Well, in that particular case, then... it is a motivation question where it's, like... Mm -hmm. You know, you could make the argument Superman's, like, like head... It just isn't enough in the game, so maybe that's why he, he... But I might have thought somebody else would bring it up, because everybody knows that he... Even if he doesn't, because everybody knows that he's... Uh, zombi that he's about to be zombified, that he's been, you know, affected. Mm -hmm. Infected. Yeah, exactly. Well, especially because they make such a big point about, like, how the Flashes both can't do anything. <laughs> they like, can't yeah. get involved. Yeah, no, absolutely. You mentioned earlier that moment where uh, Superman says, well, I don't have to catch Flash. I can just go around the other side, you know, like playing tag <laughs> on a playing round. Like, wait a minute. I can just turn around. I don't think I've ever seen that. And it seems like the most obvious thing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, exactly. Maybe there's not a lot of situations where Superman has to catch Flash or another speedster. But I wonder how often that comes up in Flash comics. Where you have well, a speedster yeah. chasing after another speedster that could just run the other direction because they go so fast they could just use the planet and go around the other side. Yeah, or even just like his other rogues, like Captain Boomerang, throw it instead of throwing it at him, throw it at, like the other way. <laughs> Oh, I was talking about unnerving moments earlier. Uh, there's there's a worse one than the one I mentioned earlier, um, where. There's one moment where I uh, my eyes actually kind of popped out of my head where I was like, wait, we're doing this. Uh, the Martian Manhunter two-page spread, <laughs> that got me a little bit, man. <laughs> oh, yeah, that part's great. That's probably, like, the most, like, horror -y kind of zombie thing and just in the sense that everybody, everything's, like, okay. You know, everybody's hanging out, and then all of a sudden just 
Martian Manhunter's burst into the room. <laughs> and suddenly just starts taking out characters that have just been added to the cast that we thought were going to do. So, like, Lex Luthor, he, mm-hmm. like, Lex comes in and is helping out with a plan to evacuate, uh, you know, people from, from Earth to, you know, move on to another planet. And... I like the way Lex is, is initially brought up, by the way, uh, when, when he's, or, or how he's introduced, um, when he basically tells Superman, like, let's let bygones be bygones, and he's, like, legitimately sad when he says, look what's happened to our city. Love that moment. Um, but it's it's not, it's, it's also not a not-narcissistic Lex, because uh, later on, when he's making fun of Superman for losing two planets, and then Lois punches him in the face, that's all great, too. Um, but immediately after he gets added to the cast and you think that he's gonna, you know, help our characters out and do a bunch of stuff, the very next page he's cut in half by Martian Manhunter. <laughs> yeah, and that's like another place where it kind of subverts the zombie thing in that most zombie things have like the the human characters that are just as much of a threat to like the main characters as the zombies. Yeah, right. And that's that's what Lex could have been. Well, in and Walking Dead, he, like, is kind all, of makes fun of it. Walking Dead is all about that, right? The, mm-hmm. the the question of like, what is more dangerous: the humans that have to uh, arguably give up some of their humanity to even survive, where they're not able to keep all their <laughs> altruism, so they're so they're scary, and and you know, it's that kind of you know rabid dog thing uh, versus just the zombies themselves. Like, which of those is scarier? And yeah, this book isn't about them. Mm-hmm. Yeah, exactly. Like, At all. The, that goes all the way back to, uh, I mean, there's some of it in Night of the Living Dead, but Dawn of the Living Dead, they're just kind of, like, joking around in the mall, like, throwing pies at zombies, and then a biker gang shows up, and it, like, ruins everything. <laughs> so, like, that's, like, a big, uh, you know, thing that goes all the way back. I really appreciate that we don't go as on the nose with the internet metaphor as I thought we might have, because, I mean just the whole idea is pretty on the nose in the first place. Uh, mm-hmm. I kind of expected the whole thing to culminate in like a internet cafe or something at the end, you know, cause I, cause I had that thought where it's like, well, we're in the, we're in a mall cause of consumerism, right? Like, where is this going to wind up? <laughs> I was, was kind of glad we didn't do anything like that. You know, it's, it, the, the, at the very end, we're just in an Amazon warehouse or well, they go, it's like age of Ultron where Tony goes to where the internet is to find <laughs> to shut Ultron down. That's where the main like fight would have been. <laughs> Yeah, the world is getting really weird where we actually, like, have a scene in a comic of superheroes taking down the internet. Mm-hmm. That's, yeah, that's, like that's a where we're at punch. now. <laughs> that's in a comic book now, folks. It's a dramatic scene of superheroes unplugging things. <laughs> yeah, exactly, like destroying all the plugins, <laughs> all the satellites, exactly, yeah. Austin, I can't believe how much mileage we're getting out of this book. I really thought this was going to be when I, when I suggested it because I hadn't I hadn't read the whole thing. I'd read the, like like an issue or two, and uh, I was like, I've been in, on in weirdly a zombie mood lately because I've been on a Walking Dead kick and I've been watching a lot of that and, and uh, starting to read the, the comics again. Well, and you're kind of like oddly like a zombie person in a in a sense, right? Because it's like you like you know Marvel zombies, Walking Dead. Um, but like none that of, kind like, of the stuff. original classic stuff. I mean, like... Yeah, but, like, still, like, different things like that, yeah. Well, and I and I love 28 Days Later, too, so... Wait, and, yeah. And I'm a big fan of World War Z. Like, I guess maybe I am a zombie fan. It's weird. Like, I don't I don't know. I don't think of myself as a zombie fan. I don't, th- yeah. I don't think of that premise as appealing in any way, but there's all this stuff that... And World War Z was the main inspiration for my food novels, so, like, I... Mm-hmm. I have this whole connection to zombie stuff. I don't know why. We, yeah, because when you asked me about it, I was like, oh, this will be interesting, because I'm a big horror guy, but I'm not as crazy about zombies, while you're not a horror guy, and you like a lot of zombie stuff. <laughs> I got, yeah, I had well, to explain it to you, I guess. <laughs> yeah, I, thanks for uh, thanks for being my therapist and helping me psychoanalyze myself in the middle of this review, because I don't know why I like the stuff I like sometimes. Um, but what I was going to say is, I really thought when I suggested this that we'd get half an hour out of this tops. 
and mm-hmm. there's there's actually weirdly some stuff to sink your teeth into. I'm not saying it's like you know the deepest and most spot provoking thing. It is wonderfully escapist. It's part of what I like about it. Mm-hmm. Um, but there's definitely more meat on the bone. Like Taylor um, is is a is is a really decent writer. Um, he's not the greatest dialogue guy um, sometimes, but I think he's I think he's improved a lot uh, since the early since his earlier stuff that you know that I've read. Um, I look at him as like a is is like a Tinian. I've been I've been finding myself comparing him to Tinian a lot lately, uh, where he he ends up using a lot of kind of you know fun classic superhero gimmicks and riffing on uh, stuff you know from old comics and movies and stuff. Um, although Tinian cannot get away from 89. He does it all the time, and there's not as much of that with with, with, uh, with Taylor with any extra media. Um, but the difference between them is I think Taylor is uh, less convoluted in his plotting. Oh, like, okay. I think he's just better at constructing a story than Tinian is. Yeah, because I've never read anything by Tinian, I don't think. I know, like, he's on Batman, but... I yeah. was kind of waiting to hear good things about that after, like, after I, Kick. <laughs> I just I just read everything up up until they started Future State, and it's rough. I think. Oh really? It's yeah. His his plotting and some of his characterization is a little CW for my taste, and he's uh, I think trying to kind of uh, be. King and Snyder simultaneously, at least the first couple of arcs. Like, I think he's trying to carve out his own thing after that a little bit. Uh, but he's he's jumping off that book now, so I don't know that he really got to culminate everything where he was hoping it would go, but... Mm-hmm. Yeah, because it seems like he's kind of just leaving <laughs> from what I've yeah. heard. I don't know. He's going to do some creator-owned stuff like a lot of people are right now. Yeah, exactly. Um, exactly. But yeah, you said, uh, getting back to this real quick, uh, you <laughs> you said that you kind of expected this to be um, a little bit more of like a standard zombie thing, and a lot of people thought it would be, it would be DC's finally like answer to Marvel Zombies, because um, Black Knight isn't exactly that, uh, but now that I have them to compare, that book is more like Marvel Zombies than this is. Uh, like... This is more Marvel Zombies in only the sense that it's not in continuity and it's an Elseworlds or what-if kind of thing. Um, That's what they have in common. Because Blackest Night, when you get the quote-unquote zombie versions of characters, they still have, even if it's like a, uh, you know, perversion of them, they still have the personalities of those characters and they talk and stuff, like in Marvel Zombies. Uh, This isn't that. This is zombie corpses walking around. Uh, Marvel Zombies is from the perspective of the zombies, because it's our heroes having turned into zombies uh, and still trying to keep some semblance of their humanity if they can. That, and that's what I like about that book. Um, and it's it's thought-provoking in different kinds of ways than this is. Um, but yeah, so in weird ways, Blackest Night is actually more like Marvel Zombies than this is, but it is an incontinuity story. Uh, and I don't know if you ever read Blackest Night, but... I haven't. I remember when that was, like, happening, because it, it was, was like... Huge. It was huge, yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I heard about it constantly. It was smart of them to do a story like that right then, because that was when Green Lantern was at its most popular, and so they did... That, that was their way of doing a company-wide event that focused on Green Lantern, but it was all about how, and, and it was kind of a de- deconstruction of this idea, it was all about how uh, characters in mainstream comics are not allowed to die and how when uh, when somebody dies we're just kind of sitting around waiting for them to come back. So we do an event where everybody that's died comes back at once but sort of as these the, uh, the zombie type characters through uh, the, the, the Black Lantern and uh, I like that event a lot. Um, I think story-wise, this is better probably, but they're oh, very, cool. yeah. they're very different things. I don't uh, think it's fair to compare anything to Blackest Night, but other mega crossover events, really. But <laughs> yeah, which is more so what I was expecting from this, uh, as opposed to it just 
mostly focusing on Superman. Uh, and then I thought I, we were going to get there. Um, Isn't it bizarrely character-driven? Mm-hmm. Yeah, even, like, outside of the main group, like, you get stuff with Harley and Poison Ivy, but it almost feels... Which I don't love distant. that stuff, but whatever. Yeah. Like, it's fine. I don't know. Harley and uh, Ivy, I think, are just kind of a weird pairing to me. I don't I don't know. Well, they've been... Maybe just because it's modern Harley, and I know it goes back to the... I was going to say, they've been best friends in lots of stuff. But I don't understand modern Harley, and Tom yeah. Taylor is not doing anything to make her make more sense to me. I feel like he's kind of walking this line where he wants to write traditional Harley, but he also is trying to appease people that like the more Deadpool version. And she's in the same breath, uh, all excited about like a death wall, and also. Uh, telling Poison Ivy that she needs to be to have more empathy and be more altruistic. I don't understand her. She doesn't make any sense to me. <laughs> yeah, no, I I have no idea what's happening with those characters. That feels kind of just there, but um... it's very obligatory to me. It feels like, mm. and I meant to say this earlier. In some ways, this feels like the Injustice universe if it had gone a different direction and didn't and started from uh, the premise that this has with the destruction of Apocalypse instead of Superman goes back, it goes bad, now go. Like, it's got a lot of the same sensibilities, but it's also using a lot of the same cast. Uh, Tom Taylor loves Green Arrow. Uh, he loves Black Canary. And he... And if he doesn't love Harley Quinn, he's using her all the time and everything. Um, <laughs> so, yeah, I don't know. I don't know if that's, like, a mandate thing or if he just knows he's po she's popular, so he puts her in there. Or if he just legitimately really loves Harley Quinn. I don't know. Um, but his cast of characters here is uh, a lot of them the same group that we follow a lot in Injustice. And written a lot of them in the same way. Like, his Green Arrow is the same character. Oh, cool. Yeah. Yeah, because... Um... I've never read that stuff, but it feels more so just like the jokey uh, Green Arrow that I'm more so used to as opposed to the CW version. Yeah. Uh, which is then what they bring over in, in uh, Injustice 2. Yeah, it's it's classic Green Arrow where like even a lot of modern Green Arrow comics like to darken, darken him up some. So even if mm -hmm. he's more like traditional Oliver Queen as opposed to the Arrow TV show um there's there's still they still read more like Daredevil comics to me a lot of the time um like I really like the Lemire run but it's it's not it's not exactly what Green Arrow was even I don't know maybe it's more like 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 uh, how he read back in uh the, you know that that uh, that Grell run in the 80s mm -hmm. uh, that, that's the not. new 52 run right the Lemire run yeah I think I read the first two trades of that, but it's been a long time now. Lemire was uh, toward the end of Fifty Two, uh, so so yeah. Oh, okay, so he maybe start not that, that stuff. It's it's rough at the beginning, um, but then when Lemire comes on, it becomes a huge top tier. Everybody's reading it book, uh, and it's really okay, good. Okay, yeah. And then when so Lemire I read the stuff that's bad, then before and then it gets when Lemire good. leaves for just a few issues because it was awful and everyone hated it and they had to get rid of him really quick it was Guggenheim oh. <laughs> I'm, pr I'm pretty sure it was Guggenheim and immediately he got rid of everything Lemire was doing and just wrote them out in like three pages and then I uh, created the comic book version of Felicity Smoke because of course he did <laughs> And then Green Arrow was like, okay, I'm going to shave my head and uh, <laughs> shave my facial hair. I'm Stephen Amell now. <laughs> you have failed this That's comic awful. company. But yeah, I uh, I would like to, at some point, um, start reviewing some of the Injustice comics, I think. Because um, now I'm just in the mood to read more Tom Taylor. Um, I think I really like this guy. Yeah, no, uh, this is the first Tom Taylor book I've ever read, and it was really good. So, I, well, and I've always wanted to read the Injustice stuff, because I've always heard, like, glowing uh, praise about it. Well, you're a big fan of those games, and that's kind of 
uh, how you and I like became friends was playing that game together. So I think it'd be really fun if you and I talked about those at some point. Yeah, definitely. Especially because like I like those games a lot, but I think their writing can be like a little lackluster. And then I've always heard the comics kind of come in and fix it. Yeah, and it's really sad that, you know, I'm saying this in hindsight, that they couldn't have had him write the games in the first place because mm. there's no reason it had to be interdimensional. And his his book is not, at least at the beginning. It probably has to become that later on because of what happens in the game. But, like, there's no reason for it. Um, no, it's bizarre. <laughs> and then they completely drop it in two because that didn't need to be there. <laughs> Yeah, it's funny because I've, you know, I get video game requests for rewind for you know certain story driven games, and that's one of the things that's come up. Some is like, are you ever gonna do the first Justice game? And I'm like, I mean, I can. That seems like a 15 minute rewind to me. I'd much rather write a rewind on on the Tom Taylor comics because it's like a story. Mm -hmm. I'm not saying there's no story in the game, and there's not a little bit, of it, but it's it's pretty typical, you know, Mortal it's Kombat. It's the Mortal fare, Kombat. Right? people coming in being like we're gonna do our take on dc and it's like yeah i don't know <laughs> and i like mortal kombat a lot but mortal kombat is what it is and like there's some cool story stuff in that and you know there's cool story stuff in those injustice games here and there but uh it's overall just kind of lackluster yeah, it plays by its own rules, and it has that Power Rangers thing, right? Where it's like, you know, good oh, Mortal absolutely. Kombat stories are good for Mortal Kombat. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. There's no comparing that to anything else, except maybe Power Rangers. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, and the whole, you know, alternate universe thing kind of just exists so that we can have, like, characters fight themselves for fights. Yeah, I have the same thing with that that I do with, uh, like, intercompany crossover things where I don't need an explanation. Uh, mm -hmm. Like, I don't like it. I've talked about this a million times, but I don't like it in uh, in, in comic crossovers where we'll take, you know, if, if you do, like, a, you know, Batman Ninja Turtles or something, uh, where you have to spend half the book explaining how the portals to two different dimensions opened and got them together in the first place. I much prefer it when they just exist in the same universe in the first place. Or if it has to be interdimensional, there's just a quick explanation on the first page where somebody offhand, Donatello or whoever, offhandedly is like, oh, we found a portal and we walked through it. Um, I have exactly the same thing with what you're talking about with fighting games where I don't need a clever explanation for why this character gets to fight himself. I, uh, cause it's just, I, I don't know. Well, I was going to say you only do that in, in, in two player matches. I guess that's not true. I guess in a story mode you're doing it, but I don't know. I don't even need a story mode in a fighting game. What, what I'd much prefer is just like supplemental comic material in the first place. Like, I don't know about you. Maybe you don't have that, but if I'm playing a fighting game, I kind of don't want cutscenes. I really kind of don't like. That's fair. Yeah. Um, I like that Mortal Kombat, I mean, I don't think that out of the newer games, any of them have been as good story-wise as the kind of first reboot one from uh, 2011. But uh, I've heard like, a lot I of like people their, say that. Yeah, and I, I do like that they do like the story mode thing, even if they aren't like amazing, especially because they still have the ladder mode that is just like the original arcade setup. Yeah. So it's like you can kind of like jump back and forth between them, especially because the majority of what you're going to do is like the actual arcade uh, setup anyways. Mm -hmm. I guess I just played a lot of fighters that didn't do that. Like Virtual Fighter never had a story well, yeah. mode. Um, so I real quick before we adjourn, let's talk, uh, let's get back to the book for just a second and talk <laughs> very briefly uh, about the... Yeah, about you can the... tell we haven't spoken in a while because we... you've been busy. <laughs> We're going off on tangents, yeah. Um, <laughs> let, me, let me ask you how you felt about the ending, just to just to wrap everything up. Uh, I, I'm of two minds about it. It felt a little, um, it felt a little quick to me. Uh like it it it, it kind of it kind of felt a little jarring um that it just sort of ends uh i there's a part of me that would have liked some kind of like aftermath scene where i could have seen you know 
something about how the characters were living on that new planet. But I guess, I in principle, I kind of like the idea of just like we found this planet and you can just imagine what happens after that. But maybe the maybe the problem was just a pacing thing where it's like the the Green Lanterns all show up and then the three pages later we found a planet and the and the book's over. Mm-hmm. Seems a little abrupt. I don't know. <laughs> yeah, there's definitely a lot going on in that last issue because it's like, okay, now Superman's a zombie. Um, he's going to destroy. Uh, they're all leaving on two arc ships. He's going to destroy them. And Black Canary's got like the ultimate kill Superman sword, and she's going to go kill Superman. And then Superman's son has to get involved. And then all the Green Lanterns show up. By the way, I'll buy. Then... I'll buy that that statue. Just take my money, you know, like like, bla- <laughs> like Black Canary, Green Lantern, uh, with that jacket holding that sword. I'll buy it tomorrow. Just put it on the market. <laughs> yeah, uh, maybe uh, when they do the Black Canary movie that uh, just got like a writer, uh, they'll do that there. <laughs> oh, wait, is that is that happening? I didn't hear about that. Yeah, the Black Canary Oh, no, actress. you told me about it because we were lamenting that it wasn't Huntress because we really liked that actress. Yeah, uh, yeah, because when I told you, it was just like kind of rumored that um, that they were doing it. Uh, the actress just confirmed that yes, they do have a writer and they're working on it right now. But I think it's also going to be a straight to HBO Max movie, okay. not like a theatrical movie. Well, and considering Birds of Prey didn't perform and was mm-hmm. you know critically um, lampooned, I imagine <laughs> <laughs> not just by me. Um, I, I, no, it's awful. I, I never imagine they will make a movie worse than Suicide Squad, and I am, they did it. I imagine they'll do what uh, James Gunn did with the Suicide Squad, where it's it's sort of there and it's loosely connected, but it doesn't matter. Like I'm sure that's what they'll do with that. Mm-hmm. Well, yeah, because uh, the Huntress actress just came out recently as well and was like, eh, "I'll be back in some way. I'm sure. I don't know. <laughs> oh, I hope she is. She was the best thing in that movie." Yeah, exactly, and the most underutilized. Um, if they bring back that Cassandra Cain, though, I will kill myself. I think. Um, <laughs> no, they just I'll have to make deceased. Cassandra Cain. <laughs> hey, I got a stretch for you, real quick. Do you think it's yep. possible that can, can I read "deceased" as almost a double entendre title? Because because DC is in the East. <laughs> So, so my stretch, I didn't mean break the rubber band. I didn't, no, um, D, deceased, uh, the, the, you got the obvious pun, but mm-hmm. it, but it, you could almost read it as, read it as diseased? Yeah. Like, almost? Let, let me look at this title. I don't know. Like, I know it's a C and not an S, but like, you know, it, it's, it's about a virus, and that's a disease, and it makes people deceased. If I kind of, like, cross my eyes and look at the title, I can see it a little. <laughs> I hesitated yeah. even yeah. bringing it. Oh, you mean if you wear the contact lenses that yeah, blur out your eyes? eyes. <laughs> yeah, if I ruin my eyes completely, I, I, I can't even see the letters anymore. <laughs> so now <laughs> it works okay. The title. Yeah, exactly. So did you have that real quick? Did you have that with the ending, or were you fine with it? Um, it definitely felt like they kind of had to rush through um, the ending just because there was so much happening. Um, uh, but yeah, I I kind of wondered that about the planet as well, and then also wondered if they would maybe do more uh, with that, which they did like, apparently. Maybe just so. like a setup for a sequel if they want to do it. I don't know. It's like this is what this is what Tom Taylor uh, begins to do now is he he starts uh, an apocalyptic DC franchise that's its own universe and then he's and then he has to write it for like years. Uh, mm-hmm. He just got it, at the time of this recording because we're recording this bef- a, a little while before I'm, I, I'll be posting it. Um, but the um, but Tom Taylor got a uh, new ongoing uh, that's about uh, John Kent, and I'm really excited about that, uh, especially hearing him talk about it because I like 
I don't know that I would have been all that excited about a solo John Kent book as with, with like him as Superman, uh, but I am with him writing it, especially because I like John Kent in this. Um, and he does more with him, of course, in the sequel, which I haven't read, but... Yeah, um, for sure, because, um, you know, you get kind of Batman and Superman, they both, you know, are replaced by their sons. And I was actually a little surprised, because we get Wonder Girl in this, and I don't, like, I know she's not, like, Wonder Woman's daughter, but I'm surprised they didn't kind of connect that, too. Good point. Just because one Wonder Woman also dies, and Wonder Girl just kind of shows up for, like, one scene. But we also know she makes it out, because she's fighting uh, the zombies with the Amazons. Maybe and, in the sequel. And uh, Queen they... of Hulk that's like, go. Oh, Maybe in the sequel they make go. a big deal out of, like, a new trinity or something. Maybe, yeah. <laughs> with her. I didn't, I didn't even think of that. I wonder why they didn't draw attention to that, yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Uh, no, I was surprised to, like... <clears throat> the like, sun's taking up the mantle thing as, as much as I did. Mm-hmm. And I don't even yeah. know that thematically we're doing anything, you know, especially uh, like, you know, deeper sophisticated with that. It's just, we we, lo- we lose Batman and Superman and these guys have to take over for, for a new age. Like, I don't know that it's saying anything, but I thought it worked really well. Well, what it's saying is that um, you can take up, like, the reins from your father, but not your mother, because Wonder Woman immediately dies after Apollo's like, Wonder Girl, take this to Wonder Woman so that she can, like, honor the Amazons and continue our legacy. <laughs> well, they, they wouldn't have done that if she had an incontinuity daughter, probably. Yeah, yeah, exactly. I think it's hilarious the way we've aged up John Kent because we've been, you know, we've had Damien for what, 15 years now? Yeah, it's been a a long time now. Uh, John Kent was invented for a book at the last legs of New 52 as an out so that DC could go, oh, wait, psych, this isn't the real Superman. Here's the real Superman. Um, when, when, we, when we brought in uh, the Superman from the original universe uh, that Dan Jurgens uh, brought in for the Lois and Clark book. And uh, that's where John Ken is invented. And so we've only had him for, like, six, seven years now? <laughs> And uh, we we're having to play him like he's had as much you know uh, like play in continuity as uh, as Damien has. It's really funny. Well, it's like uh, Apu's children in The Simpsons, who I think are born in like season eleven, and then at a certain point they're like older than Maggie. Because <laughs> <laughs> when we first got John Kent, he was like eight, and now he and Damien are both like I don't know. 15 maybe i don't know and i don't know what tom taylor is doing with that uh with with that new john kent the superman book because in in that and i think that's supposed to be in continuity but i don't know if it's if it's set in the future or what exactly it is because like he's just apparently being superman and yeah so i, <laughs> I, I don't know it it re- the, the the interview with him reads like it's an adult john kent but i don't know why uh, it'll be an apocalyptic universe uh, that's old man John Ken. Because <laughs> it, it easily could have been a spinoff out of this whole thing. Uh, well, I say that, but I haven't read the, read the sequel, so I don't know how many characters are still alive at the end of that. Mm-hmm. Yeah, exactly. Marvel Even Zombies the, the immediately had problems because they kill of off... Marvel Zombies killed off, like, everybody, and they immediately had problems with sequels because, like, nobody's left. What do we do? <laughs> Yeah, at least with this, it's like we we mainly just kill off like the Justice League. Like, there's so many characters because it doesn't have that event focus of throwing everybody. You can kind of just be like, ah, this person's still alive. But it's not like the New Fifty Two Earth What Two book, where we kill off we you know really contrived way we kill off the Trinity in the first issue. We just open up with just, they all die. <laughs> Oh, is that, like, a thing? I've yeah. read that. Yeah, that's a thing. Oh, my God. <laughs> I wanted to love that book. And oh, no. Was, and it was not good, but... 
I least hope what I read of it. Well, I open the sequel to this book. Constantine shows up for one issue and is like, "I'm, I'm gonna matter," and then he doesn't show up again. <laughs> you even <laughs> you even said to me in text, you were like, "Well, obviously that was the first of a mini series. No, that was a one shot." <laughs> You're like, "How's that a one shot? It ends on a cliffhanger." Yeah, because Dr. Fate shows up and he's like, this is not how you die, uh, Constantine. Come with me. And he's like, I'm going to save the universe. <laughs> the f- Real quick, I was going to end this 20 minutes ago. The funniest stuff in all of this is uh, is, is actually in that one shot. Uh, you, got that, you got that great line uh, where Dr. Fate's like, uh, you cannot penetrate the helm. And then I can't remember who it is, but somebody is like, it's also made of metal, so you probably don't want to punch that anyway. I thought that was really funny. Oh, I think Dr. Fate says that too, because uh, Constantine's like, oh, like you came in here now? Like, you jerk. And then he punches Dr. Fate, and he's just like, ow. And he's like, yes, you do not want to punch the helm. Also, it's metal, so you really don't want to punch it. <laughs> and then, that was really funny. Uh, and then the share reference was kind of great. Yeah, it was their dying. Uh, it was dying words to her. <laughs> That's probably the most like zombie-ish, like like what you would expect from this book, right? Is that issue? Where it's just kind of them going around killing zombies, and then they all get taken out, like, one by one. And I'm glad the whole thing wasn't tonally that or those characters, because as much as I was enjoying his Constantine, uh, I hate Booster Gold with, like, a burning passion. <laughs> and, uh, I, you know, I appreciate moments, because Tom, Tom Taylor, very, very uh, self-aware about some of this stuff. So, like, I, I appreciate lines like, uh, Booster Gold has saved the universe. There, there's a there's a line you never thought anybody would say. Uh, like I appreciate stuff like that because I hate Booster Gold, but I'm just glad that I didn't have to read him through this entire thing. Okay, so I gotta ask because I I had yeah. to like look it up afterwards and I got no answers. Is Booster Gold like related to the Flash? Because he disappears and they're like they found the Flash's dead corpse. Oh no, Booster Gold's never been born, and then he disappears. <laughs> I didn't know what to make of any of that, yeah. I didn't know what was going on with the time travel business there, and I decided I didn't care that much because it's an unru- it's a you know, tangentially related one shot. Like, okay, mm-hmm. Booster Gold tried a time travel thing, something, something, didn't save the universe, also didn't destroy reality, so I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> At first, I thought that was just going to be a fun, it. offhanded uh, reference when they're like, or, or or just idea when they're like, well, we've we've got a couple things we can try. We can either do magic, or we can do this thing that would risk all of reality to save humanity. Let's not do that. And I think it would have been more fun if that was just never brought up again. <laughs> we don't even know what the plan is. Well, we could we could mess with reality. You know what? This time, this time, let's not do that. <laughs> yeah, that would have been pretty good. They should have all just gone to hang out at Constantine's uh, bar. It should have just been Shaun of the Dead. They got to get to the bar and they just hang out there with a monkey serving them drinks. Yeah, that would have been good. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Anyway, well, I, I, didn't, I needed that monkey to fight zombies. I did not think we'd be talking about deceased for an hour and a half, so we're going to uh, bid you guys farewell. But thanks a lot for watching. hope you enjoyed this, and we will see you again for another review, hopefully in the not-too-distant future. And uh, I don't know what we'll do with uh, the very next video with Austin and I, but at some point, um, I think it would be fun to look at at least some of Injustice, uh, even if we don't go through the whole thing. But, um, so yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Maybe we can do it by, like, the year uh, breakdowns. Because you said it was 12 issues, right? That's what I would want to do, yeah. So we'll do uh, year one, and then we'll, like, drop it. And then we'll have to go back to year one. And we'll just keep reviewing uh, year one (laughs) over and over. Look, we just, we need to refresh ourselves, so we have to post the 55th review (laughs) of Injustice year one. Yeah, exactly. And... And you'll, like, hold on to them for a while, so you can do, like, the, <laughs> the Injustice Year One 
six month cycle, <laughs> which is every single day. <laughs> we'll have more one. reviews of Injustice Year One than we have of commentaries on Batman eighty nine. Exactly, that's the goal. <laughs> Austin, thanks Eventually, for there'll this. be the review where we we just read it. <laughs> Uh, thank you for reading this with me because I know you don't have uh, you, you didn't have any experience with this writer or even uh, Marvel Zombies or anything, uh, but which I need to read now. Yeah, <laughs> I just thought of you because of Injustice mostly, mm-hmm. even though you haven't read that. Just because that's that's a game that we've played together a lot, and I just this is Tom Taylor, and I just for some reason I'm like, yeah, Austin, let's see if he wants to read this. Yeah, and uh, I walked away both really enjoying this book and being like, okay. I gotta go read Injustice, I gotta go read Marvel Zombies, I gotta go read Hellblazer, like there's just so much stuff I wanna read now. <laughs> it's a rabbit hole now, yeah. <laughs> yeah, exactly. When I pitched this to you, I really thought it would be a thing that we would just make fun of. I can't believe that we both enjoyed it as much as we did. Mm-hmm. I know, it's crazy, like, it's this shouldn't work as well as it does. It's good stuff, I mean, I'll totally read it again. Mm. I'm excited about the sequels. Yeah. Yeah, no, hopefully those, uh, like, maintain the same quality. But I guess, like, with Tom Taylor coming back for them, they're probably still pretty good. Well, anyway, thanks a lot for watching, everybody. Uh, once again, hope you enjoyed it. We'll see you again soon. I was Captain Logan, and this was The Day Ghost. I'm a zombie now. Grrr. <laughs> 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 All right, see you later, folks. Bye.